Perfect, thank you. We're actually, actually going to get less formal. So I was just presenting to hundreds of leading economists um, a couple of hours ago, hence the shirt and tie and so forth. But I think now it's much better. I can take that off, relax a little bit. Um, it was wonderful to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you very much for listening to me in English. I, I really do appreciate that, so thank you. Um, and the first time I was in Budapest um, was an interesting experience. I've been here many times since, but there's a contrast, I think, to, to the city, the wonderful city we now have. Uh, it was, I think, summer of 1988, August 1988. I was telling the story to, to James, uh, that I've known the Karl Marx for many years, that it was I was a very poor student travelling around Europe. Um, I'd effectively run out of money, but I wanted to go to Vienna for various reasons. But in Vienna, I realised I couldn't afford to stay in Vienna. And I think someone said, well, go to Budapest. Um, and so I got a visa and travelled across the, the Iron Curtain, as it then was, um, I had the most amazing, after a sort of scary trip where I arrived, and it was just you know, in the evening on the train, um, I was interrogated by sort of soldiers on the, on the train, um, got off, it was a very dark city, a very different to you know, what it is now, not, not a single light anywhere, um, contrast arrived last night and it's a very bright and lit up city, um, and then for a government office getting a or into someone's bedroom, sort of about an hour's drive outside of Budapest. Um, very interesting experience. Have been back, I think, about 10 times since, since 1988, and just watched the development of this wonderful city. So it, it's great to be, to be back here and to give this presentation. This is very much a financial presentation, but I think, you know, but I, am a, I do have a chemistry and physics degree, so I have some, some credibility in the science gathering. Um, but I've spent most of my career as a, as a lawyer um, applying the science of, of you know, the environment and then climate change um, through law to the world of finance. And I think one of the things you know, it's critical to understand is that all of the emissions that would drive us to an unstable climate have to be financed, they have to be paid for. So you have to find a way of, of reducing or, or switching off that flow of money to finance those emissions, and that, that's a key part of our role. I think the other thing, that if, if you're going to do that, if you're going to convince the people who go into investment banks and asset managers and all the other parts of the financial ecosystem to switch, to turn that switch, you've got to get them to understand what climate change means to them in their day-to-day -day job. So you've got to take the key aspects of the climate science and translate that in some way or form into a language and into a narrative that is relevant to your average energy analyst or energy asset manager or investment banker or corporate lawyer or you know, consultant at McKinsey or PwC. So I think you know, one of the biggest achievements of Carbon Tracker was to take you know, a key aspect, a quantitative aspect of the climate science, the carbon budget, and I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a moment, and say, okay, well, the carbon budget is very straightforward. You know, we know that on a scientist that comes to this conclusion that if you want a 50% probability of staying below 2 degrees, you know, which is pretty scary in itself. I mean, God, that's Russian roulette on steroids, isn't it? Imagine playing Russian roulette where you've got half the chambers full of bullets. But anyway, um, we have got to keep global CO2 emissions below 2,000 gigatons against a pre-industrial baseline. And the problem is, certainly when we did the work, the original report back in 2011, we only had 900 gigatons of that budget left. And on the cut, you know, the emissions pathways then, like, it looked like we will burst through the two degrees, the 50% probability budget by around 2033. Got to, you know, still not looking much better than that. So you've got to get the trajectory down. So what we did, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is we said, okay, well, how do you how do you turn that into something that 
someone in the financial markets understands, or well, you've got to compare it to real world assets that are the basis of valuations of companies and equities and debt, which is of course the carbon locked up in the world of oil, gas and coal reserves and resources out to 2050. So we, you know, it's all, this is all very basic, noddy number crunching. But it ended up being quite powerful, is you then say, okay, with 900 gigatons, versus how much carbon approximately is in all of those oil, gas, and coal reserves and resources out of 2050? Shit, 3,000 gigatons. Big disconnect. And that began to sort of make sense, because, and then we, then we said, okay, well, let's, we've got to frame that in a language that makes sense to someone in the financial market. So we just gone through the global financial crisis, so, ah, bubble. They all know what a bubble is. Carbon bubble. And then they all know what an asset is, so stranded assets. And they all know what demand is for a product and a business model, demand destruction, and so on and so forth, wasted capital. And we started to create a financial lexicon that allowed an investment banker or an asset manager or, or an energy analyst to, to understand the implications in his, in his language, in his world, of the carbon budget. So that's I guess the, uh, right, that's the big picture. But who are we? Well, we're an independent, not-for-profit think tank funded by a range of US and EU foundations interested in climate. Our vision is a climate-secure global energy system by 2050, which is, as you will know, net zero emissions by 2050, but a hell of a lot easier said than done. What we're about is how do you map that transition and how do you align climate risk capital market risk and actually get the financial professionals to understand this is that this is a real financial risk that if they don't address is going to bite them in some way or form financially. So that's, um, that's our mission, our role, very simply. It's more complex than that in many ways. Now, I think what, you know, as part of getting these guys to understand how quickly things play out. You know, we talk about other technological transitions. So, of course, you know, take, if you can, take yourself back to 1991. Here's a little photograph of the typical electronic goods on sale in 1991. And think about how far we've come since 91. Now, back in 91, when you were looking at those sort of things, could you have imagined, you know, this or, a, you know, a smartphone that would actually be using these? Um, they're talking into these things like Captain Kirk, you know, it's the sort of Star Trek that I used to watch back then, um, and so on. And it's great, you know, some of it we could have imagined, it, imagined but some of it we, we couldn't have imagined. I mean, you go back to programs made in 91, they got some of it right, but some of it they completely underestimated. Um, and now go forward an equivalent number of, of years and just think what we were using, how we'll be doing things. Um, what will really take on and change, and what impact for, you know, will that have on all of these big energy companies and the financial system as it is now? And these transitions are, can happen very quickly. And I mean, our question is, you know, are energy markets facing similar disruption? Now, the Paris Agreement, you know, clear market signal, but it's not legally binding in the, in the sense one thinks of traditional laws. It's not even as robust as the Kyoto Protocol from 97. Um, but for the first time, it does set, you know, all governments in the world have signed up to this aggregate target of two degrees and, and go beyond to one and a half if we can, um, which puts a backbone in the two degrees target. And net zero emissions, the GHGs, by 2050, you know, does imply an earlier phase out of CO2 emissions by as early as 2050. Um, so, but, you know, 187 countries have submitted plans, energy you know, transition plans. Unfortunately, they don't add up to two degrees, but they are a significant shift from business as usual. So going in the right direction, and there's a really good ratchet mechanism in Paris every five years to try and build in more ambition. So we've got a, we've got a framework. Um, the, the interesting thing, I think, is why did we get a, you know, I was in Copenhagen and in Paris and many of the climate sessions in between, why did we fail in 2009 but succeed in 2015. In many ways, I think because the, the, the scale up of clean technology and the, the dramatic and unexpected reduction in costs of that technology between 2009 and 2015 gave the politicians a signal. And they, so they could say, oh God, we, 
I actually now can see in 2015 how we're going to meet that, whereas I couldn't see that in 2009. 2009, it was looking very expensive and like governments would have to be out in front leading. 2015, oh, the technology's out in front, so really actually all we've got to do is speed up that technological transition that's now already underway. That's a much easier ask for a politician than before. Um, now, these INDCs, or National Determined Commitments, even though they don't add up to two degrees, would commit the world to about 10% lower fossil fuel demand against business as usual by 2030. That's a big shift in the business models of the big energy companies. And the good news is the energy transition is happening. You know, and we did a recent report with Imperial College taking their energy demand model and updated a lot of the assumptions and also to start to think about how can an energy demand model move away from the sort of linear approach that is employed by most of the, or all the energy demand models, which is, oh, the past is a linear projection of the future, to start to think about it in a more disruptive way and how, how might those disruptive changes play out. And what we concluded is, you know, even with some relatively modest shifts around demand, costs, and assumptions, um, is that there's a very plausible scenario that solar PV could be 23% of global power by 2040 and 29% by 2050. Electric vehicles could provide 35% of road transport by 2035 and 66% by 2050. What does that mean for oil, gas and coal demand? It means coal demand peaks in 2020, oil demand peaks and plateaus in 2020 until 2030, then declines, and gas is still growth in gas, but it's a lot lower than the industry is predicting. So that's a big change for many of the business models of these companies. The bad news, as I alluded to, is time is running out. You just look at how quickly we are burning through that carbon budget. So, and we get, you say, if we carry on on the current trajectory, BAU trajectories, we're talking about the early 2030s for the time we've exhausted the two degrees budget on a 50% probability. And people are now saying, well, you know, that, that's pretty scary. Probably maybe we should have a 60 or 80% probability. Well, we burn through that a lot even quicker. Or what about a one and a half degree? I mean, a lot of people post Paris because one and a half degrees is mentioned in the Paris Agreement, say, well, we should have a one and a half degrees. And a lot of scientists are now saying, well, actually, at two degrees, um, hmm, that's looking a bit scary, actually. What is safe is one and a half degrees. Well, on an 80% probability, as I understand it, we've already used that up. On a 50% probability, we've got maybe five to eight years left. So thinking about practically pushing that curve down, um, that ain't gonna happen. The only way that happens is if we bring online huge amounts of negative emissions very quickly. Um, that's a whole other story. We can talk about that but, uh, in, in Q&A. So, we get to the overhang. So the work we did back in 2011, 2013 has been the, you know, was in many ways the spark for the divestment movement. And what really got Carbon Tracker illuminated, if you like, was Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben. And they, they wrote about it a lot, but Bill McKibben wrote this really powerful piece of writing that's energised a lot of people to get into this movement called Global Warming, the Terrified New Math in Rolling Stones magazine. Now, if you haven't read it, it's well worth reading. It's a very powerful piece of, of writing. We don't actually, and I'll come to this, we, we don't actually advocate divestment for a variety of reasons, but it's a very powerful movement. It's very clear. It's a lot of people engaged. It's created a massive grassroots movement. Um, you probably know across many universities in the world, um, big divestment movements that have occupied the offices of the universities demanded that the universities um, divest their endowments, divest from fossil fuels. Big campaigns at Harvard and Yale and Berkeley and Cambridge and Oxford and, and so many universities across Europe really energise student bodies around this issue in a way perhaps they haven't been energised around a political issue since apartheid or in the US civil rights in the 50s. So, quite a powerful idea. Um, but you can see. You know, because I am, again, understand, I'm a climate scientist, but I understand it's not linear. It's not like you burn more of this and there's a linear rise. You know, the more you burn, the more the feedback effects shoot up. 
I like simple analogies, and I think it's like it's when a number of charities or uh, philanthropic funded NGOs in the 70s went out and counted all the world's nuclear warheads and went gulp, you know, there's enough nuclear warheads out there to basically fry the planet seven or eight times over. Well, we're in a similar situation. There's enough fossil fuels in the ground have dug out and burned to, to basically heat, overheat the planet several times over. You know, we're not going to five or six degrees, we're going several times over if we were to burn all of that over the next 30 years. Um, probably physically impossible in terms of the impact it would have and the disruption it would have. But, you know, there's not a marginal disconnect between the two. So you begin to see, you know, even if we massively overshoot 900, no way to deal with that. So the oil and gas companies can't be around in the present form for the next 30 years. They have to change. It's just, you know, there's almost a physical reality to it as much as anything. So what, we're, we're, you know, of course, the rebuttal to us was, oh, that's all very well, Carbon Tracker, but it's very high level. You know, very simple, yes, get it, but it's very high level. In the real world, you know, that's not how decisions are made. And we said, well, yes, we agree, which is why we then went out and we recruited a whole team of former investment bank analysts, ex Barclays, HSBC, Citigroup, and so on. And we went out and bought the commercial data on all, you know, from the commercial data providers that the investment banks and the companies use. We started analysing all of the world's projects against cost curves. And we came to this conclusion that many of them were a bet on a very high demand, future demand and very high future oil, gas and coal prices. And were incredibly, you know, they're climate risky, they don't make climate sense, but we also came to the conclusion many oil, gas and coal projects out there don't make financial sense either. And we, you know, we, did, we identified those projects and concluded there was, you know, if current spending plans continue, in all of those companies, $1.4 trillion is at risk in oil, $220 billion at risk in coal, and $520 billion at risk in gas. So we're getting sort of getting more granular and really starting to try and delineate what the you know the wheat from the chaff in terms of projects. And this is where that that oil, gas, and coal, which we think is financially and risky, sits. Now coal is the first victim of the energy transition. And if you think about how this plays out in the financial world, with a 10% drop in market share um, of seaborne coal led to the collapse of US coal equities in five years. So their share price just collapsed at 98% in five years. 30 to 40% of them went bankrupt, including the largest private coal company in the world, Peabody. Um, and incidentally, a year before they went bankrupt, Peabody was still saying, no, demand for coal is going to be massive and the Future coal prices are going to be, you know, very robust, very healthy. You know, dear shareholders, don't worry about it. A year later, they were bankrupt. And sadly, they've come back to life, but that's, an, that's another story. Because, in many ways, they were using the straight line syndrome in terms of growth and demand, and not building in the fact that we're now in a disruptive phase of energy technology. We also looked at many, you know, there's all this, you know, people say, yes, but the Chinese and the Indians and the Vietnamese and the Thais and the, um, are building all of these coal plants. On paper, they are, but when you dig below, you find many of those coal plants aren't going to happen. And you also find the economics of many of those coal plants simply don't add up when you, when you compare them against real world constraints. So again, deploying financial analysis to try and, you know, flick away many of these default positions you get back from the incumbents and those have a conservative view of the world. And what you also find is geography doesn't support their claims either because five out of eight of the countries with the fastest expected population growth and therefore need for energy have no coal reserves themselves. So it just doesn't make sense for them to build coal-fired power. Also, in many cities, they don't have existing energy infrastructure. It doesn't make sense for them to use 19th century energy just, you know, technology here high energy distribution grids to build an energy system when increasingly have access to 21st century energy technology. So this is where we started back in May 2014 when we started working on cost curves. And we this, this basic curve is plotted against the costs and emissions, you know, carbon tied up in all the world's projects, but the break-even prices as well for those projects. And what you, what we found we did this in May 2014, the oil price was $130 a barrel, 
we did our analysts did an underlying demand analysis that concluded that the fundamentals did not support an oil price of $130, maybe 70 or 80 in, in the long term. But we, we found all of these projects, some, some requiring a break-even oil price as high as $200 a barrel, that were going ahead, were sucking in billions of capital from companies, and shareholders were not blinking an eye. Um, and we were like, well, how? Okay, what's going on here? How are the companies and how's the energy sector getting away with deploying capital, a huge amount of capital, often borrowing, often at the expense of their share price, to build and develop projects in the Arctic and the tar sands and ultra deep sea um, and new coal mines and all the rest of it. Oh, this is oil, but it's a similar issue with coal. Um, and that took us to demand and many of these demand models. It was the demand models that were telling them and governments and everyone else, oh no, look, demand for oil is going to be huge by 2030 and 2040 and therefore the oil price is going to go up um, and so on. Therefore, of course, we need to invest in all this extra supply. So we started unpicking that. The other interesting thing about this curve is we, everything below $60 break even, you know, we can actually burn over the next 30 years within the carbon budget. What was fascinating for us geopolitically is that 80% of that sits in Saudi Arabia. They have, they have the lowest cost production. Actually, for the Saudis, counterintuitive, I think, as it is, a two degrees transition is good for them as long as they get to sell the last marginal barrel of oil and we don't open up all that out of a supply in, tar, in the tar sands of the Arctic and ultra deep sea. And a version of our analysis was taken down to Riyadh shortly thereafter. Um, Sorts of other geopolitical issues going on, but I think the Saudis get that now. And, and what we're now seeing is major global oil and gas companies are starting to shut down or sell off these higher cost assets. So it's beginning to sort of play out in many ways. Exxon Mobil has recently written down 19% of its oil reserves, you know, such as giant oil sands projects, uh, become uneconomic. And we did, we did some very specific work back in 2014 on the oil sands where we basically said, you know, projects like Curl, you know, are putting million, billions at risk. Just don't make economic sense. And obviously they don't make, they don't make climate sense either. But coming to demand, we, we did a piece called Lost in Transition where we looked at the, the, the way in which the sector from the IEA, the National Energy Authority, through to the companies themselves, BP, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, and so on, model energy demand. We found it was very similar, incredibly similar actually. And it's a very linear approach. Modeling generally is still quite difficult, as probably anyone here who does modeling will know, to, to sort of model unpredictable, disruptive, unexpected changes. Um, but it's also what, what you find is it's really easy to underestimate technological advances. You know, and you know, things like EVs, efficiency gains, digital disruption, all these other things. So here's a, here's a good example of that. Here's a sort of spread of predictions for um, what actually happened with, as I understand, what actually happened with solar and utility. Here's what, or oh, sorry, of what people thought was going to happen with solar. And from 2010, here's what actually happened. And if you talk to any analyst, they're like, well, I think back in 2010, if I put out a prediction on a curve like that, I'd have been sacked, I'd have been laughed at. Greenpeace were the one set of analysts who came closest, but even, even they massively underestimated what actually happened. So it, it is, you know, it, it, it is a challenge, and particularly most analysts look around what everyone else is predicting, and you don't want to be too far out of line with everybody else. Because you'd get, you know, it wouldn't be taken seriously. And this is, in many ways, I think, of, you know, one of the. I feel a little bit sorry for incumbents. This is one of the problems, and maybe one of the reasons incumbents struggle to kind of imagine a world, a different world, a different technology, a diff which invariably creates different business models, and how they play in that, and how they ride that transition. Now. You know, technological transitions are nothing new. They happen again and again. 
and they're all different. You can't really compare directly the transition from railroad to automobiles or from Kodak film to digital film or from typewriters to laptops and you know, from fixed line telephones to mobile. Um, they all have their own intricacies and they play out in different ways. But what seems to be common amongst all of them from a business perspective is the companies, the incumbent companies, almost always fail to survive those technological transitions. No matter how big, how long they've been around, how big their balance sheet is, how politically well connected they are, they almost always fail. And they almost always go and follow a similar pattern, which is denial, you know, oh, this will never happen, it's, you know, ridicule, it's, you know, it's, this, this digital photography thing, no. this automobile, that's, that's never going to really catch on, no one's going to drive around in one of those crazy contraptions, they want railways, and uh, they want trains. Um, and then when, when it starts to really, you get, you get into the exponential part of the S-curve for that technology, and they start to go, oh God, actually, yeah, shit, this is starting to eat in a bit, this, this might be a bit more serious than we thought. Instead of saying, you know, really engaging with it, all right, okay, how do we be part of that? They lobby, they get the lobbyists come in, they go and see the politicians, they pass laws like red, you know, you have to walk in front of an automobile or a red flag. There was one law as a result of lobbying from the railway industry in the US, uh, in, I think it was Connecticut, I could be wrong here, which was, they, they actually got the legis state legislature to pass a law that if you were driving your automobile down the road and you came across livestock, you had to get out, turn your car off, dismantle your car, hide the components behind local bushes and shrubs, when the livestock had gone, you could reassemble your car and continue on your journey. Now the governor, a bit more sensible than the legislator, refused to sign that into law apparently, but um, you know, we see this again and again, we're seeing it now, a lot of lobbying in different countries against renewable energy, trying to sort of restrict and reduce you know, the, the growth. Um, the question is, will history repeat itself, or can the big oil and gas companies, for example, be smarter than their predecessors and somehow survive the technological transition. Um, you know, we will see. So here's, here's a good illustration of how that can play out. Okay, we talk about, you know, and we see this you know, very similar to some of the growths for solar and wind and other things at the moment. You get into you have an S-curve and you get into an ex exponential bit, this is what happened with digital. But what's difficult, I was difficult for Kodak, was that was still a really small, tiddly market, even up to 2000, compared to how much, you, know, you can see where they were up here, how much money they're making out of traditional cameras and film. Even as that goes into the exponential, it's still really piddly small for them. And actually, even as this is growing exponentially, they're actually doing pretty well. They're getting some really good growth out of traditional cameras and film right up to 2000. And then you get to that tipping point and boom. Now, of course, um, Tim Harford, the undercover economist, wrote another book called Success Starts with Failure. And he kind of tries to analyze this, not in relation to energy, but other transitions. And he says, you know, imagine, I mean, let's just take Kodak, for example. Imagine you're, you know, you're one of the up-and-coming executives. You're on that flight path. You, 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 you reckon you've got a shot at being CEO. And you're expecting you're going to be given the camera division or the film division. And that's your stepping stone to really make your mark in the company. And the next step is CEO. And the CEO calls you into the room and he says, you know, John, um, we've got this really new, you know, I, I know you're expecting, you know, you want, you know, you're lined up for film. But, you know, we've got this new thing called digital. I imagine this is 1990 or even 95. And actually, John, we think that's the future. And I know it's only a fifth of the sales or 2% of the sales of cameras, but I want you to run the digital division. He's going to be sitting there going, what have I done wrong? How did I screw up so badly? Um, why am I being punished like this? You know, so it, it's that, and, and Kodak had a digital division, and they wasn't making money, and they sold it. Um, and obviously the rest is history, a Kodak moment. They, what I'd encourage you to do is, is so how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with this disruptive idea? Well, you, you, you've got to expect that predicting the future, no one's ever going to be right. And all you can do 
is think about a range of scenarios in different criteria. And what you've got to do with these models is you've got to allow them, I think, to be flexible and, plug in and look at what happens if you change certain parameters around. So, okay, what happens if there is a much lower cost for solar? Or what happens if there is bigger growth or less demand for oil or actually a stronger climate policy or weaker climate policy? And that's, you know, at a very rudimentary level, this is what we try to do in our expected unexpected report with Imperial. And there is a, an interactive tool, you can go onto our website and you can play around a little bit with some of those settings. So in terms of energy demand, technology costs, and strong to weak climate policy settings, and see what happens. And here's just some of the sort of examples of, of that for electric vehicles, different obviously in 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, with sort of the different policy settings, I think that is, um, and what then happens to the mix of vehicles on the road. Um, and we see, you know, positive settings, we see sort of potentially a third of all vehicles could be electric by 2035. That's not impossible. In fact, as recent reports come out, they're much more bullish than us on this. So, and then you've got to say, okay, well, what does that do for oil? demand. How does that displace oil to electric vehicles? And this kind of gives you an idea. Um, this could impact so 26% of predicted oil demand. Um, 2 million barrels displaced by 2025 um, a day compared to 100% of internal combustion engines. So, you know, big issue for the oil and gas companies. And as I said, you know, predict, we predict this sort of peak demand. But you see, under all of the scenarios, pretty much, you get tailing off, or peak demand is just when does it happen under all of those different settings. Now, the problem with the companies, until now, until fairly recently, even now with many of them, is all they've been doing is going out to shareholders and investors and saying, giving them one view of the future, which is their business as usual projection. And our view is that's, that, that's potentially seriously misleading investors and shareholders. It's all very well to go out and say, well, there's this range of some future outcomes. Here's the business usual one, which is the one we think is going to happen because, but you as shareholders and investors need to be aware of these other projections. So a lot of our work on the regulatory side has been to campaign for financial regulators and the markets to insist these companies set out a range and actually think about the other potential scenarios as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Now, what does that mean? You know, why do we care? Well, because what we're seeing is, if you take this linear approach to the world, well, for the last 80 odd years, it's been great. It's been growth, growth, growth for fossil fuel companies. And that's in, for many of them, they can't imagine a world that's not like that. So their whole, bit, so their whole business models, until very recently, have been very much predicated on exploring, developing, and adding to their reserves and resources growth. And what we're saying, well, great, but that world is the world's now changing. We're now in a disruptive phase. You know, you've been lucky enough as fossil fuel providers to be in a linear phase for 60, 80 years. Um, World's changed as it always does, you know, and we're now in a disruptive phase. And that means you guys have got to go X growth. We're still going to need a lot of your product. It's still a big business for you over the next 30 years as we transition. This, ain't going to, this is not going to happen overnight. But what, if, you, if you deny that and you continue down this growth mindset, you will destroy a lot of value. That will be very bad for your businesses and very bad for the financial system because you will build up risk in the system which will lead to a disruptive transition rather than a smooth transition. And here, you know, this is already playing out because this is, you know, what you used to get year after year is a really good return on investment per share from the companies. And around 2006 that started to change. This kind of highlights, you know, and even during, even during periods of high oil prices, the return on investment 
within those companies is going down. Because they're taking the revenues from historically relatively low cost, you know, current reserves and resources, which we will need. We're not in dispute with them that we will need that and that will get used over the next 30 years. But instead of using that revenue to either maximise dividend and share return and share price or invest in clean energy, they're punting it forward up the cost curve into ever more risky and expensive oil, gas or coal exploration and development and destroying value. And at the same time, they're borrowing, we understand Shell's borrowing something like a, you know, um, a, a, a billion dollars a month, but it's fairly standard, um, to meet dividend payments. So, yeah, you know, that may, that may be a good bet, that may pay off. I'm not disputing that. They may be right, but on the other hand, they may be wrong. And you just need to sort of sit back and say, well, it is a bet on future high demand and future oil price. Which incidentally, guys, is very inconsistent with a two degrees world. That means our business model is predicated on a world at three, four, or five degrees. And, you know, that, that would be an honest approach. And I think this, this illustrates that, uh, again, no one can predict the future, but what we do know is things can play out in a very unexpected way. So here's as a proxy for many of these energy sector predictions, the future of solar growth. These are IEA predictions in the past for how solar would grow. Here's what's actually happened. Completely underestimated the growth of solar. So let's, you know, let's talk about the political situation. Um, let's call it the Trump scenario. Even with weak global climate policies, you can still see a situation where over 70% of the world's power can come from non-fossil fuels by 2050, and more than 65% of world vehicles being electric. Even with weak climate policy, we are in a technology-driven transition now. It's technology that's in the driving seat. And the role of policy now is very much, in our view, to oil the wheels of that technological transition, speed it up, because the winner is clear. But the problem, so it's not a case of if, but it is a case of when. And if you think about that clock, how quickly we're moving up, we're eating up the carbon budget, the when is really important because how quickly the winner gets across the finishing line determines whether we have a reasonable probability of delivering a stable climate or not. So we want to, you know, and people like to be on the side of the winner, so let's help that, you know, the important thing is to help that winner go even faster get them across the finishing line quickly enough to deliver a stable climate. And actually, there's a, there's a positive financial case for doing so, because we've done a sensitivity analysis on the business models of the seven biggest oil and gas companies in the world, and we think there's a really good argument that if you put them on a two degrees pathway, next growth, two degrees pathway, so still selling a lot of oil and gas over the next 30 years, but they're not gradually less every year, and they're not out there exploring and developing and replacing reserves at anywhere near the rate they would like to. They would be collectively worth 100 billion more. So this is, this is good, that would be good news for shareholders. But the, but the, the, the challenge is getting that, you know, after 70 years of the world working in a certain way, many people are quite set in the way they view the world, and the challenge is actually getting people to understand that and see that the world's changing and, and think differently. So that as much as anything, it's a psychological communications challenge. And again, let's remind ourselves that this plays out quite often and catches people, even very clever people, unawares. I mean, the other thing is there's more and more analysis, we've done analysis, that... As an average now across the world, and certainly in particular places, clean energy, you know, clean energy is cheaper. It's a cheaper alternative to the incumbent fossil fuel technology. Particularly where people haven't already got energy infrastructure. The world's energy poor. 80% of the world's energy poor live nowhere near an urban centre. So, why would you build all that expensive old-fashioned, 19th century, maybe 20th century at best, energy delivery technology 
when you can use 21st century distributed technologies, um, which are much cheaper and, and give you much more bang for your buck. But it, same as why would you build a fixed line telephone system in a country that doesn't have a telecom system now, you would jump straight at mobile communications. We're in, you know, same sort of disruption. And we all need to get away from this thinking that it's all about cost. Actually, yes, we want to deal with the climate, so that's going to cost us. It's, you know, it actually, you need to turn that on its head. If you're not part of this technological transition, it's going to cost you because you'll be behind the technological curve. You'll be using the old technology and you'll be watching other countries, you know, power ahead of you using cleaner, cheaper technology who are not dependent on importing energy from, you know, politically unstable countries or countries that might want to exert control over you in exchange for their oil, gas or coal. The good news is financial regulators have woken up to this. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England and Chair of the World of the D20 Financial Stability Board, you know, has written out, has, has done a, you know, a number of speeches. It's well worth listening to some of those. They're very good. He's a really good speaker. And he said, the abrupt transition to a low-carbon future is a financial stability risk. Now, he, you know, his view is that one option for a global firm is they can apply a transition scenario that takes into account the nationally to commitments of the countries uh, in which the businesses are located, the NDCs being the national plans to implement the Paris Agreement for each country. Or, you know, they can, they can test their business models against two degrees scenarios. And again, that's, luckily that's what the, the Financial Stability Board Task Force is set up as recommended as one of its key recommendations for all sectors of the economy. So hopefully that will, that's something that will get taken on board. And the private sector you know, is really stepping in. There's now a plethora of reports from HSBC, City, Standard & Poor's, um, MSCI, Ernst & Young, Standard Life, Towers Watson, BlackRock, not listed there, but BlackRock have put out some pretty hard-hitting reports on climate risk and the risk to companies and shareholders. Um, interestingly, there's been a shareholder resolution passed against Occidental, a, a US oil and gas company, asking them to assess the risk of two degrees and do a stress test against their business model and disclose their climate risk. Um, that shareholder resolution failed last year because big shareholders like BlackRock didn't get behind it. But this year, they got behind it. And one reason for why they got behind it might be that last year they were criticised. People went, well, just a minute, you're putting out all these reports, BlackRock, saying the climate risk is a real issue that people have now got to take account of and address. Yet, on the other hand, you're voting against shareholder resolutions asking companies to do exactly that. What gives? And I think they, they, they probably internally must have gone, oh, yeah, that's a bit inconsistent, isn't it? So actually, we better get behind these shareholder resolutions. Um, because otherwise we, we don't look very clever saying this, but doing something completely different. So I think that's quite an interesting development. And there's more of these shareholder resolutions to come. They're starting to get real traction against companies. So implications for companies. Well, look, it's not, you know, we're not switching off oil and gas overnight. It's still a very important business, one we need for the next 30 years. We need fossil fuels for the next 30 years but we need gradually less year on year. And we need that to be in, as part of a transition to a net zero emissions energy system by 2050. Even in that world, those, those companies, if they, if they recalibrate their business models, can make a lot of money for themselves and their shareholders. So, it, you know, not all doom and gloom if they take into account and they change. So large areas of agreement of our thesis. So little threat to existing supply projects. Um, rate of production decline is likely to be greater than decline in oil demand. So we still will need some exploration and development of new resources. It's just we've got to be smart about which ones we do need and which ones we don't. But we need to manage for weak demand. That's, that's going to require a certain or different mindset. So conservative view of future demand and pricing. Focus on low cost, low risk, high return projects. And where these are not available, return cash to shareholders. And it's the importance of per share metrics rather than absolute growth, which, is a which seems to be a major metric of these companies, um, as opposed to actually how much are we 
making of, you know, and how much value we're creating for shareholders. Uh, shrink to grow, in other words. So it's an easy message at the moment, but, you know, if the oil price peaks again, which it probably will, uh, there will be some more volatility in oil prices as we go forward. Um, but the danger, you know, if, we, if they just then rush back into high cost exploration development, you're creating, you know, you're reinforcing that volatility and, you know, boom and bust as opposed to the smooth transition. So, of course, what we want to avoid is a very sort of disruptive, explosive photo finish. Um, and we have the information, people have the insights, there's no excuse not to manage the transition um, properly. And what we need to do is make sure we get there in time. And the financial markets and investors who finance all of this stuff and the emissions that would keep us over two degrees or finance the clean technologies that can help us make that clean transition, they have a big role to play. But the sad reality is they have to understand that this is a real financial issue. Thank you.